Have you seen my prawns? Your what? My prawns. Have you seen my prawns? Did I leave them out? What the hell is... What the hell is a prawn? What the hell is a... Prawns. Little pink lobster things. She doesn't know what a prawn is. What's a prawn? What? Prawn? You're having a laugh, aren't you? No. No. Prawn. P-R-A-W-N. Pr the, 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 the lob you know what a lobster is? Yes. The smaller... You're going to think you're an idiot when you realise it. What, a crab? Not a crab. It's smaller than that. Like little curly things. Like you, you put them in... Things. Like a uh, prawn cocktail. Like a co you drink them? No, you... I don't think so. They're pink. They're like little... You know what shrimp is? Seafood cocktail. I didn't come up with the name. Okay? It's just... The, how do you not know what a prawn... How have you gone about... Do you know what a scallop is? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like a group of stuff that's like scallops and then crab and clams and prawns. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> they don't know what a prawn is. Hello and welcome to the five year anniversary special of Seven Days of Science. Starting off the news this week, immensely popular science news series Seven Days of Science, which releases episodes weekly from the Benji Thomas channel, celebrates its five year anniversary this week. The hosts Ben and Doug have, with a little help here and there, released a video a week every single week for the last five years. Alongside their standard format of science news stories being summarised in a short video, they have also branched out and covered exclusive stories, interviews, and even introduced a mysterious and rather baffling law. It's a great achievement for such a small team, and we at Benji Thomas send our heartfelt congratulations to Ben and Doug for keeping Seven Days of Science running for so long on Benji Thomas. And in other news this week, a study published in the journal Nature Geoscience has taken a look at one of the long-standing questions of planetary science. How does Venus lose its planetary heat, and exactly what processes shape its surface? Despite having many similarities to Earth, Venus does not have tectonic plates, and so we can't extrapolate processes that happen on our own planet to determine exactly what happens on its twin. This new study draws upon data gathered late last century by NASA's Magellan mission to find its conclusions. It found that Venus does actually have a similarly thick lithosphere, the outer parts of the planet, to Earth, and conclude that Venus heat flow relies much more heavily on plumes, magma activity, and general fractures in its surface, allowing heat to escape through it. A scientist at NASA has commented that understanding Venus is a key part in helping understand what the Earth's geology could have been like billions of years ago. And finally from me this week, a 220 meter crater in France has been officially discovered in findings that will be presented this month at the LPSC 2023. It is often hard to find direct proof of such small craters being meteorite impact sites, and so while this crater was mentioned nearly three quarters of a century ago, it has been mostly ignored since then, despite a couple of hypotheses about its true nature. Further analysis recently, though, has led to the discovery of iron oxide spherules, shock microdiamonds, and encased nickel-bearing iron at the crater, all pointing conclusively towards a meteorite impact. In addition, magnetic readings inside the crater, showing that the Earth's magnetic field is weaker inside, also points towards this conclusion. Some very interesting news that will help add to our knowledge of meteorite impacts of whatever size and their effects on the surrounding environment. And now over to Ben with some news that must be reported on about- Thanks Doug. 
Well, first up in the news of this very special episode is a new study that has looked at how non-bird dinosaurs managed to grow so big. The authors explain how it's always been generally accepted that the way in which animals get to very large sizes is due to an increase in the growth rate, but that only a few studies have properly investigated this while taking into account the evolutionary relationships of the organisms involved. Well, this new research looks at a massive dataset of theropod dinosaurs, finding that not only did growth rate play a role in growing large, but so did changes to the duration of the growth time. In fact, rate and duration played almost equal roles in the evolution of this range of body size in theropods, with certain clades managing to grow larger not just by increasing growth speed, but by growing slowly over a long time. Spinosaurids, for example, seem to have gone down this route, getting huge over a long time, whereas Tyrannosaurus accelerated the rate of growth comparatively more. It's a very interesting analysis, and the paleontologists say that such trends are expected to show up in other groups of animals too, so hopefully we'll see more research into this in the future. Also in the news is a paper investigating the function of therizinosaur claws, and as they're my favourite dinosaurs, this is always nice to see. As the paper explains, a lot of Maniraptoran dinosaurs, that is, the large and diverse theropod grouping that includes the birds and related groups, had grasping hands or hands used for flight, but lineages of early diverging Maniraptorans, including Therizinosaurs and Alvarezsauroids, had prominent claws of unknown function. The research therefore applied finite element analysis to the claws of Alvarezsauroids and Therizinosaurs, and plotted out their functional space, basically working out how the mechanics of the various claws performed under different stresses. The results of this were very interesting. Derived alvarezsauroids with their short, strong arms and single functional digits were found to be efficient at digging, which is quite expected given that this function has been suggested by many studies in the past. However, the function of therizinosaur claws is quite intriguing. Early branching therizinosaurs, such as Alxosaurus, Erlianosaurus, and Falcarius, had relatively smaller and non-specialized claws that were shown to be good at piercing and pulling. So, using these structures to pull at vegetation and reach branches to feed on seems reasonable. But then we come to Therizinosaurus itself. This giant dinosaur had such ridiculously huge manual claws that all the basic functions the researchers tested on them resulted in the claws risking structural failure. So digging, gripping branches, and attacking other dinosaurs <coughs> Jurassic World, are all ruled out. The paleontologists instead suggest that Therizinosaurus may have used its sickle-shaped claws in behaviours that didn't require much stress-bearing, such as sexual display or warning intimidation displays. It's therefore possible that, if the claw size was being sexually selected for as an attractive feature to mates, this could have driven the evolution of such huge unwieldy structures, perhaps similar to the evolution of giant antlers in Megalosaurus. But Therizinosaurs apart from Therizinosaurus itself all showed pretty good mechanical performance when they tested for hooking and pulling vegetation, scratch digging, and piercing, with the paleontologists suggesting they were ecologically analogous to giant ground sloths such as Megatherium. So a very interesting study indeed, revealing all sorts about the biomechanics and behaviours of these amazingly bizarre dinosaurs. Thank you Ben. We've been doing 7 Days of Science for 5 years now and it's been an incredible journey. From cutting off the intro as a single joke, to it becoming a long-running gag, from finding something a little entertaining to do during Covid, to creating a Seven Days of Science lore. From those of you who have been with us from the beginning, to everyone who has watched us in the last five years, as we've posted every single week, I want to say... Thank you. Well, five years of Seven Days of Science. It really has been quite the journey. The show has been transformed quite a few times since we started back in 2018 and, hopefully at least, improved as we've learned along the way. I'm quite proud to be able to say that in five years we've never missed a week, even as life got pretty hectic for Doug and myself as we went through our A-level exams, applications to university, eventually actually starting university and then being bombarded with all sorts of other work and other projects to work on. Even when we were in the middle of the South African Karoo for several weeks and we had no way to produce these episodes, my brother Ollie very kindly took over for a few weeks and managed to keep our record for us. It's been absolutely incredible too to watch the science of paleontology develop over these last five years. So many fantastic and mind-blowing discoveries have been made in the last five years, and it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to keep track of these and to talk to so many other people who are passionate about this science. Anyway, here's to, hopefully, another five years of Seven Days of Science and even more amazing paleontological discoveries. Oh, and also be sure to keep an eye out for this week's episode of Boneheads, where we'll be joined by a very special guest star, Doug A. James himself, where we'll be talking more about the impact, the creation, and the history of Seven Days of Science after five years. Yep. 
Thanks, Ben. That was basically everything I wanted to say. So, thank you. Thank you to everyone who's been a part of this, whether it was sending something in or being part of a silly intro. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for every single kind or funny comment over the last five years. And thank you for being a part of this really awesome journey. As Ben said, here's to another five years. That's nearly it from us this week. I do hope you've enjoyed five years of science. And as always, we'll see you on Sunday. Well, first up in the news of this very special episode, Okay. Is there anyone else in the house? No. I need your help. Can you come? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what for? Just come. Where are you going? You don't need to know. Alright? Whatever happens, just don't tell anyone. Okay?